When will Worcester, Massachusetts annex the town of Holden? That's what we're asking today on 508, a show about Worcester. It's October the 19th, 2018. I'm Mike Benedetti. This is Brendan Malikin. Hi, Brendan. How's it going, brother? It's going good. Now, our guest today is Worcester legend Frank Carthizer. <laughs> Hi, Frank. How you doing? Frank, founder of the Mustard Seed, recently retired head of Worcester Interfaith. Um, if we're going to speculate on Worcester annexing Holden, <laughs> do we want to start with that or do we want to start with Frank? Uh, I, I don't know. I, mean, I didn't realize we were going to annex Holden. I didn't even know this was on the, so here's the, in so the cards. Here's, so, is... so, I mean, so Frank, we always sort of look at look at Worcester, Massachusetts as though it were a TV show. And so when I look at the news this week coming out of Worcester, I say it's sort of like what plot threads are they setting up? So here's this thing, Holden, Lemonster Housing Authorities to get help from Worcester Housing Authority. This mm. is a uh, Telegram article by, from Cyrus Moulton. Have you seen this? I have not. So uh, uh, Holden Housing Authority has 50, 60 units. Mike, not to interrupt, but I'm going to yeah. interrupt. I usually go through my three free articles from the Telegram Gazette within about 12 hours of the first day of <laughs> yes. the month. So yeah, anything yes. that happens after the first of the month, I, I tend not to see in the Telegram. I read all the local news, I read especially the crime stuff. Um, so you know, Holden has 56. Uh, units that are under its housing authority and Worcester has like 7,000 and so Holden and uh, Lemonster both are saying like you guys have like an actual staff and maybe you could just kind of roll those 56 units into your 7,000 and that would make more sense than us having all this infrastructure that's not working sure. right. So they're, they're still going to have oversight, they're still going to have some employees some part time employees but um, I just sort of feel like like what is this setting up mm -hmm. and I think it's obviously it's setting up a big long protracted battle where Brooklyn, or not Brooklyn, in the same way that like Manhattan annexed Brooklyn, or we've seen we've seen this happen with other cities in the United States, Los Angeles annexing a bunch of other towns right. because of water rights issues. That Worcester is going to annex all the adjacent towns, starting with housing authority stuff. Well, you know that was, if I'm not mistaken, one of the last columns that a friend of the show, Jim Dempsey, uh, wrote for the Telegram yes. was a, a, basically a proposal for Worcester to annex Auburn, which okay. at the time was the sexy neighboring mm -hmm. community uh, with the, the heavy tax base. And realistically, I think at the time it was probably 80% of the residents of Auburn were just one generation removed from Maine South. So they really mm -hmm. were Worcester people. It's like they didn't do anything in Auburn. They can't, all they knew was Worcester. But but that isn't that why they went to to Auburn? Was get to, I think it was just to, to say they weren't from Worcester anymore. Oh, I thought but it was then just to came, get out of Worcester. But I think they, what, at the time though, what were they going to do in Auburn? It was, you know, unless you were like trying to recreate <laughs> some sort of a agrarian society. I don't think there was, was barely a mall back there then, right? Yeah, there wasn't yeah. a lot going on, so mm -hmm. they kept coming here. But Jim had this great concept of of annexing. Auburn, it's silly, and I know what you're saying is, is silly, mm -hmm. but yes. it actually makes a lot of sense if you think about it from an infrastructure perspective. Uh, mm -hmm. You take any of the towns that are neighboring the city of Worcester uh, and just pick a department. Pick, pick a DPW, pick a, a you know public safety department, a school department, and there's all sorts of challenges to ever for making this sort of thing work, but when you look at the, the duplication in job description, like there's I, my favorite one is always in Paxton, right? Like if you look at the hierarchy from like a Paxton fire department or a police department, it doesn't make sense, Paxton residents, to be paying a chief of police salary and, and a fire chief salary and a superintendent of school salary for the elementary side if all you're trying to do is say, hey, we have this stuff too. Like we're right next door here in Worcester and we actually have more resources. We have people that are just as well trained. Like you keep some some stuff local, like maybe your your lieutenant or your captain is a uh, is is a town resident your or police, whatnot. You have a police board, but you don't need to constantly be reinventing the wheel from an infrastructure perspective in ev all 351 cities and towns in the Commonwealth. Makes no sense. Is there? I, I'm sort of surprised that Worcester could actually do this, like annex somebody's housing authority. Do you? I mean, is is there a possibility that we could take over policing in an adjacent town? I would have to guess the regulatory hurdles would be impossible. I don't know that it's so much regulatory. I think it's, it actually comes down to the lo local control, which is something we take a lot of pride in, and rightfully so mm -hmm. in, in Massachusetts, and always have, especially when it comes to uh, school departments and whatnot. And, and there is a great deal of pride in, in having your own municipal services and, and, and what have you. But there are plenty of towns out in you know western mass I shouldn't say plenty a fair number of smaller communities that don't really have a police we had one just a couple months ago where the whole police department quit overnight right and it's not like you know the wheels fall off the bus you're, you're talking about a community that didn't really have much need in the first place and the state police are more than capable of pr providing those services you go back 20 years we had the state police taking over uh the town of spencer for law enforcement uh, due to some some legal issues out in, in the community there, there are certainly models to make things like that work and i'm not talking about it from 
hey, we're Worcester, we should be running the whole county sort of perspective. It's just at a time when everyone is concerned about budget constraints. Uh, when you realize the amount of resources that go into just replicating identical systems from town to town to town, it just doesn't really make a lot of sense. But what do I know? I'm, I don't run <laughs> governments for a living. Well, I, th I think it's a good point when you think um, I grew up in Chicago mm -hmm. and uh, Cook County is a strong governmental entity. Sure. You know, that does stuff and has a budget and all that. When we got rid of uh, county government now, yeah. it just it's every woman for herself or whatever. I mean, it's just yeah, a I little guess... bit of chaos in, in that home rule thing. Plus, the systems we need need to be regional. Transportation, right, right. health care. I mean, all, all of them need to be more regional. Yep. Affordable housing and, you know, county government could do some of that. I'm glad you brought that up because I, I, I never really go down the county government road because, you know, I was just... I'm just old enough to remember when we started dismantling the county government mm -hmm. system in Massachusetts. And you, I think we probably did it for the right reasons. And you could probably draw another parallel with uh, Cook County or, or, or Illinois in general, where mm -hmm. uh, there was so much political power to be had at those county systems that right. it got a little dirty. And, you know, we, we, we thought we were cleaning something up. And, and at, for, from a timing perspective, we probably did. But at the end of the day, we really dismantled one of the unifying uh, regional aspects of, of Massachusetts government. And, yeah, we've never, I don't think we've figured out a good way to replicate that. No. Home rule doesn't do it. Yeah. I'm just playing around with the camera for a second here. <laughs> <laughs> what, um, what, so when, when Holden and, you said it was Lemonster looking to? Yes. So they want to just completely dismantle their systems no, and no, just, no, or no, just no. have leadership be taking it over. Uh, I mean, they would have uh, they would they would still have employees, but it would mostly be run out of Worcester. Okay. Yeah, I, see, I see nothing yeah. wrong with that. Yeah, that seems like a totally reasonable thing to do. Hmm. When do we take over the rest of the town? Does that still have to be by force? <laughs> well, this is the, or is so, so this is the so this is the question, and this is kind of the problem, or the, I should say the challenge, in Worcester completely taking over. Holden using this as like the Trojan horse is that something like 10 percent of the housing units in the city of Worcester are public housing. Sure. I can't figure out exactly how many housing units are in the town of Holden. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing my best guess is like 1 percent or less are public housing. So if you took over the Worcester Housing Authority, you would already control 10 percent of the housing units in Worcester. That's a great deal of power. You sure. Could, if you're, you know, you don't have to be so, such, so much of a Machiavelli to like take over the rest of Worcester if you have that. But Holden, I think, doesn't work that way. You might have to take over some other municipal services in Holden yeah. to really get the claws in, to really be able to move to stage two. And also friend of the show, Peter Luke's, uh, you know, pretty sharp guy, right? And he's probably got his eye cast on uh, on Worcester at all times, just to make sure that we're not trying to move in on his territory out there. <laughs> I don't know. Are we ready to go to a, a thing? All right. Uh, hey, all you juggalos, libertarians, eclectic change makers, and passionate Worcesterites, this is the 508 Show. We'll be back after these messages with more. Go this ahead. is the water, and this is the well. Drink full and descend. The horse is the white of the eye and dark within. This is the water, and this is the well. Drink full and descend. The horse is the white of the eye and dark within. This is Brendan Malikin. Hi, Brendan. How's it going, Mike? This is Frank Carthizer. Hi, Frank. How you doing? And I'm Mike Benedetti, and also Gabrielle Powers is producing the show. This is the 508 Show. You're listening to Unity Radio, broadcasting with 100,000 milliwatts of power on 102.9 <laughs> FM and streaming at WorcesterMag.com. You can call in live at 508-471-5265. And thanks to the mighty Gabrielle Powers for engineering <laughs> today's show. Frank Carthizer, how are you doing? I'm well, and you? I'm doing good. You uh, you just retired from uh, Worcester Interfaith. Yes. Um, although retired might be strong. I think if you retire, that implies that you have money. Okay. <laughs> I'm not positive, but I think there's some correlation there. So your, I'm leaving Worcester Interfaith. Your role is changing. Yes. How did you first? How did you first end up in Worcester? Because you're not a Worcester native. Right. Um, I got recruited by. Brown, I grew up in Chicago. You know, Chicago's so flat, if you get out of your car, you can see Florida. You sure, know? sure. So um, uh, I came out here. Brown recruited me to play football. I came out for a weekend in Providence. I was like in heaven. Mm -hmm. The ocean, the mountains, the holy mackerel. Terrain. Um, the terrain. So I went back to Chicago and talked to the principal and, you know, my football coach. And they said, well, Holy Cross is out that way. So I ended up coming out to go to school. 
So, so, he, so they thought Holy Cross was going to work out better for you than Brown? Well, I think they thought, you know, I don't know how it was when you were in school, but when I was in a Catholic preparatory school in Chicago, I only heard about Catholic schools like Notre sure, Dame, right, right, right. St. Thomas, John Carroll. You know, I didn't even know the University of Chicago existed or that it was a good school. Till I came out here, <laughs> I was definitely I was definitely that way about college when I was in high school. I was I was aware of yes, very very few colleges. Right. Well, someone said to me, well, you know that when I said about Brown, they, you know that's an Ivy League. I said, well, what's that? <laughs> 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 what was your position? Football. Uh, defensive back. Defensive back. Did you yeah. play for Holy Cross? I did. I just freshman year. I don't know if you remember. Oh, you guys weren't around. Sophomore yeah. year of my of. Uh, uh, at Holy Cross, the entire football team got hepatitis. I, I won't go into the details. <laughs> yeah, that's I won't a... go into the details, and I'm I'm glad that I I Actually, played. You know what? Do go into the details. <laughs> no, no, how I do we not know that story? I, uh, this is... I played ball in the in the spring, but I didn't go out in the fall. And we were playing um, Harvard, and one by one, players out on the field, Holy Cross players, started to drop and come out, and it was bizarre. Yeah. I can't believe no one's optioned this for a film. As, oh, yeah. my God. I yeah. mean, it's two people that pride themselves on, on having a pretty healthy catalog of obscure and mostly yes. useless yeah, Worcester right, hist- right. historical yeah. knowledge. I feel like we have totally failed uh, our audience on this right. one. So just one piece. Of the, <laughs> then the the practice field for Holy Cross was on top of the hill. So at Holy Cross, you don't go left or right. or mm-hmm. you, you go up or down. So if you go to the top of the hill, there was a practice field up there where the heart center is now. Mm-hmm. And there was a, the access to water was a pump, you know, hand mm-hmm. pump and stuff like that. And I guess some of the kids from the neighborhood were playing around the pump, you know. and Oh, somebody, so, so, so the water got polluted one way or the other. Yes. Yes, and yeah. How long ago did you go to college? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, this is, I mean, this was like the. Like, I started in '68. '68. So that was. And, and so, I, I, yeah. I dropped out in '70. Uh huh. <laughs> right. So I mean, '68 is a pretty momentous year to oh start in college God. in this country. Oh my God. Yeah. And I know you were involved in lots of political stuff. Well, that was the thing. See, I was a jock, so I was I was involved in playing ball. And it was really the gift of Holy Cross to start to learn about what was going on in the real world. You know, as a white, Catholic, middle-class kid from Chicago, I thought everybody got treated like me. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that if you didn't look like me, you got treated a whole lot different. And that's what I learned um, being at Holy Cross, um, learning about the Vietnam War, and being a part of that whole political thing was understanding what was going on. And that's part of why I ended up dropping out. You you ended up dropping out because of well because then I'd be one A and so okay. I was trying to you know piss off the uh, draft board and um, so you so because if, when you were in college they're not going to draft you when you're in college but you, you got show, a deferment right. that's what happened to rich kids who go to college you get a deferment so called by, a two S so by dropping out you're sort of get, putting some skin in the game I'm putting skin in the game and I'm saying you can't play around on the side of a hill while guys that you know are dying yeah. And so I left to start doing anti-war work. There was a group called Clergy and Laity Concerned, and the concern was the Vietnam War. So I could go into uh, religious congregations and talk about the anti-war movement and Mm -hmm. stuff like that. It was a great time in Worcester, a tremendous time of ecumenism, some interfaith work. And so I felt like I wanted to be in churches because the values that I had that, that got me upset about what was going on came from my faith life, you know, from my Catholic education and stuff. So this was a way to put that to work in the world as well. Did, well, did, did you end up getting drafted? No. Yeah. <laughs> I've never won a lottery except <laughs> for that one. I think it was, I forget what year it was, 71 or 72. They went to a lottery system and it was your birthday and my number was 312. Whoa, okay. They would have, you know, out of 365, obviously, they would have had to have been in New York Harbor to call me yes, up. You yes, know? yes, yes. What was um what was the tone up on at Holy Cross at that time in regards to in relationship to the, the Vietnam War and, and some of the student uh, movements that started to happen uh, throughout the country? I mean, I, know, I think locally the schools kind of always thought of as being one of the more conservative socially schools in in the, in the city. But. You won't believe this, Brennan. They 
There was so much going on. They talked about Holy Cross as the cradle of the new Catholic left. Really? That's what was going on. Is that unbelievable? We Uh had Dan and Phil Berrigan, Father Dan and Father uh, Phil Berrigan came up and spoke. Dorothy Day was up on the hill. I met Saul Linsky up there. Just got to to meet these incredible people. Even at the time, I didn't even know what I was, who I was meeting and what it meant and mm-hmm. what it would mean for me about changing the direction of my life, you know. But there were, and then there were tremendous student leaders up there, Ray Dooley, uh, just a, a number of uh, incredible, incredible folks. Huh. Yeah, and so, uh, but we weren't alone. There was a, a pastor in town, Reverend Carl Klein, who worked at the Collegiate Religious Center. So it was a campus ministry to all the campuses. And he brought a bunch of leaders from all the schools together, and we did the anti-war work together. Those, as a matter of fact, those young people at the time, those friends are my best friends still today. They're all, Brendan, they're all still here from Clark and Assumption and Worcester State. Most of them, I'm still working with all of them that came out of our anti-war work. That's fantastic. Then. Yeah, it was great. And so I, I, we have seen a few generations of... Um, People uh, who sort of dedicate their life to the Catholic worker movement come out of Holy Cross, which has been surprising to me. And you were, at, at least at some point, you were in that situation, right? right like you, right. you got involved with doing Catholic worker stuff in Worcester. Mm-hmm. And this is a movement which, you know, I feel like the shorthand version is to say that they do the works of mercy and oppose the works of war. It's a movement uh, that was very energized, re-energized by the Vietnam, the Vietnam War and having something that it could oppose, that there were a lot of energy around opposing it. Uh, how did you get started with doing that and starting the mustard seed? In well, I was just very fortunate. So uh, when I decided to drop out of school and um, thinking about doing more community work, um, a professor from up there, great uh, renowned uh, American Catholic historian, David O'Brien, said, well, where are you going to live? I said, gee, I don't know. He said, well, do you want to move in with our family? Mm-hmm. And they lived over in uh, Auburn, right off the, right over the hill from Holy Cross. So I moved in with him, and Dave, uh, uh, almost right away, um, uh, Bill Miller, who was writing a book about Dorothy, the Long Loneliness, he was asked to edit it, the book for, yes. for him. And so I got a chance to read that version of it, start to learn from Dave and his wife Joanne about the Catholic Worker Movement, and. Um, there was another guy who was even more involved in the anti-war work than myself, a guy named Sean Donovan, who graduated from Holy Cross around 1970, and he was out hitting draft boards. They were raiding draft boards and burning, um, you know, uh, draft cards. Okay. The, the Berrigans hung around. They, they'd hit the draft boards, and then they'd hang around, and the cops would arrest them, and they, not Sean, he just hit the draft <laughs> boards and took off. It was more know. of a heist-type situation. Yeah, right. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, Sean was was wanting was starting to feel like he wanted to be more hands on, and so he was looking to come back to Worcester and do the Catholic worker thing. And I had told Dave that I was interested, and so Dave got Sean and I together and my wife Brenda, and the three of us started looking around for a storefront, and uh, we opened up at the corner of Pleasant and West. We opened up a storefront for the uh, Catholic worker, and it was actually Sean. You guys don't remember the 70s, but it was, you know, these funky, I don't know, spas and corner stores. And okay. so he said, let's uh, let's name it the, the mustard seed. And I said, Sean, we can't. They'll think we're selling, you know, incense and, you know, all this crazy stuff. But the mustard seed is a great line from the Christian scriptures about... Um, uh, faith, you know, and so yes, we ended up. If, if you have the faith, that the, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, which is a reasonably small seed, very small, yes. yes. And actually, just one quick story about the seed. So we had the we had the storefront, and um, you know we'd been there about a year, and the landlord was pretty sick of us and getting ready to throw us out. What, what were you doing with the storefront? Well, we just first of all we just were sitting there. That's what we did. <laughs> we just chairs, sat there. Then couch. we then we'd have coffee. Then, um, you know, we'd st- hang around. Then one day a woman came in because there's a hill. It's at the pleasant west top of a hill. A woman coming up from downtown, going to the elderly towers, opened the door and said, what are you doing? We said, well, I don't know. 
<laughs> what do you want to do? She said, well, put some coffee on. So we put some coffee on, you know, and then other people, what do you do? Well, we got to eat, put some soup on. Well, what about clothes? People got to have clothes, man. So just as people came in, we just did a little more. Then the landlord threw us out, and this family, unbelievable Catholic family from uh, Grafton Hill, uh, to raise money for us, went out and sold mustard seed necklaces and keychains. So it was a little necklace with a little, in a little latex ball, was a little mustard seed. They raised like three grand, which was the <laughs> wow. down the down payment on the house on P- Piedmont Street uh-huh. came from the money that they put together. And this is the same location where the mustard seed soup kitchen is today. Ninety three Piedmont. In yeah. in between that house burned down at some point, so that's why it's more. It doesn't look like a house now. It looks like a sort of institutional building. Right. It yeah. burnt down. It was a three decker. It burnt down in eighty eight, and uh-huh. we went and had a little prayer service. And we when we came out to from a house we own next door. We came out and there was a rainbow over the top of the the old mustard seed house. So we said, okay, Good we, sign. Got to, we got to rebuild this thing. Good sign. How, and Catholic Charities helped to give to their credit. How long were you, how long was the mustard seed like one of the main things in your life? It was, that was through the, uh, set, we opened in 72, October of 72. And it was the main thing for, for probably that, decade, but it wasn't my main, you know, form of income or stuff like that, but it was what we had to keep going. But it was really Jerry DiNardo and Mike Boover who were the on the house people. So I wasn't an on the house. Uh, Jerry and Mike did that. and Their, their names were on the mortgage. Yes, their <laughs> names were on the mortgage. I didn't want my name on the mortgage uh, because uh, I wasn't paying taxes at the time, and uh-huh. I thought the taxes would, you know, that yeah, might yeah. be a hassle. But I think uh, Mike and Jerry thought I was just trying to, you know, sure, be, be able to sure <laughs> And they could have been right. But um, so so they had their name on it, and um, I threw some money in, and I'd, you know, spend some time there, but they really kept it going. Were you, were you gonna no, no, no. I'm just enjoying listening to the story. <laughs> this is fascinating. <laughs> so what were you doing? Um, where are we time-wise? Oh, we should take a... You want to take five minutes? Talk five more minutes? And then, yeah. Okay. Um, what were you doing? What were you doing, like, uh, you know, income-wise and otherwise? So, I, so for the... Um, just to get some money, I took a job at the state hospital working with heroin addicts. Okay. Actually, the woman who headed it up was Norman Mailer's first wife, a woman named B. Silverman. Okay. Headed up this drug unit up at up at Worcester State, and um, so I was doing that for money. And Brenda was working up there as well, and um, then we started a, a, a little business uh, to. Uh, learn how to do home building skills. We called it Abraxas okay. Home Services. And we could make money doing that, but we could also hire folks from the mustard seed who wanted to work with us to paint and do work. So that was uh, Larry uh, Marinelli was part of that, and Daria oh, yeah. Meshnuk. Yeah, yeah. They were all they were all anti-war folks that we had worked with. And yeah. Uh, let what me, was the uh, yeah. no? What was the the, the the response? I would like to hear both like from the neighborhood and also the city when the mustard seed first opened up. Well, um, as as a storefront, it wasn't a, we didn't hear much. There yeah. wasn't a, a big deal. But when we bought the house, we went around to the neighbors just to tell mm-hmm. them what was going on. The neighbors were great. Next door neighbor would bring over a salad. Mm-hmm. so that we could serve it as a meal. And we started to do housing there as well. So the neighbors were great. Citywide, early on, very early on, the churches started to step up and um, help out. Holy Cross is always, the students up there, the everybody up there, chaplains mm-hmm. office has always been 100% behind it. I feel like there's a, a, a theme that's running through every story that you've told, that as long as... There is some Jesuit representation in the background. Uh, you can you can uh, destroy uh, federal offices when it comes to draft cards. You can skip out on taxes. It's I feel like this is everything that that yes. I've done wrong, wrong well, in life, Mike. Is that there aren't enough Jesuits behind yeah, me? That's right. Just yeah. could, you could have got a hold of Dan Berrigan. Yeah. He <laughs> would have brought you right up to date on where we're going. Yeah, it was great. So uh, is is the next thing to ask about in this uh, sort of uh, capsule biography of Frank Carthage, is the next thing to ask about interfaith, or are there things in the middle? Well, there's things in the middle, but the, the biggest thing for me about the mustard seed was, you know, 
I just started to get depressed. Hmm. You know, it was great to be there at first. It was mostly older guys um, out, dealing with alcohol, out of work. But then the state of Massachusetts closed the state hospitals. Yeah. So then people who were dealing with mental illness started to come. Then vets from the war all messed up on drugs. They started to come to this. So what I'm getting at is the line got longer and longer. Well, when we opened the house up, the idea wasn't, oh, yippee, let's grow a soup kitchen. You know, a soup kitchen in the richest country in the world, that's an embarrassment. Mm -hmm. And so we just saw it growing, and that, that to me was getting discouraging. That you felt just because it was emotionally exhausting or because you felt like there were these root causes that where there was more leverage. Right. We were going in the wrong direction. The idea was to shrink the mustard seed, right. not to franchise it. Oh, yippee. Yeah. No, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, <laughs> at least someone's paying attention, Mike. This is 508, Worcester's Libertarian Voice. We'll be back in a minute with more. <laughs> that's that's kind of crazy, too, that, I mean, I mean it, it, being able to have that experience firsthand of watching Worcester evolve, whether it be from a mental health perspective, mm -hmm. an addiction perspective. And some of my favorite data points when it comes to opioid addiction in general, I mean, there was a lot of data that was collected from the Vietnam era showing that the folks that came back, like pretty much everybody had at least a taste of a heroin problem when they were overseas. Mm -hmm. But the determining factor as to whether or not they got clean or stayed with an addiction problem was where they came home to. Really? Like the folks that came home and they were in areas where there were jobs waiting for them or education opportunities, well, the addiction, it, it, it was you know almost not an issue, not the way that we would contemporarily mm -hmm. think of mm -hmm. how to treat heroin addiction. Right. The folks that were coming back to more depressed or areas that uh, were starting to enter a post-industrial phase, like Worcester, all the big cities that had you know a huge heroin problem back mm -hmm. in the 70s, mm -hmm. that seems to be where there was uh, it stuck, and it got really depressing really, really fast. That's a, mm. yeah. There's a really, really interesting data points out there on the Vietnam era, and, and overlaid by, by today's standards. Again, it's a lot of researchers looking at, like, what is the underlying thing that's happening in society today where we've seen this right. huge uptick right. in uh, opioid addiction where it seems a lot of folks look at it from the perspective of it's uh, whether it's a point of origin or down the road, there's some degree of self-medicating going on. Mm -hmm. And what's the underlying root cause of that? Yeah, yeah. That's good. It's an ordinary day in Worcester, Massachusetts. But wait, look, down on the ground, it's a germ, it's a worm, it's 508. Bursting from the subterranean depths of Wormtown like the mighty Shy Halud. It's 508, a show about Worcester with Brendan Malik and Frank Carthizer and myself, Michael Benedetti. Frank, how are awesome. you doing? Good. Thanks for being on the show. Glad so I feel like here. we heard about you coming to Worcester. Uh, we've heard about your retirement. Heard a little bit of the, the in-between. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think Mike mentioned on the way out, the big piece that's missing is Worcester Inter Interfaith. Right. Well, again, that's another credit to Dave O'Brien. So I'm watching the soup kitchen grow and grow. I'm getting more angry, more depressed, mm -hmm. probably even just confused, too, because um, you wanted to see change happen, but how do you do it? We were called leaders. I mean, that's how we talk about students at these elite colleges. But what does that mean? How do you, how do you pull that off? And so... Um, I took a job heading up the Urban Ministry Commission for the Diocese of Worcester and uh, started then to learn about community organizing, but also this great tool in the Catholic Church called Catholic Social Teaching. It's a 175-year history of the church struggling with social justice, with the economic question, you know, what's happening to working people and working families. And so um, through my work with that, I discovered community organizing. Community organizing is the anti-poverty tool of the Catholic Church. Catholic Church is the largest funder of community organizing through a once-a-year collection called the Catholic Campaign for Human Development. So I learned about community organizing, and then it was a matter of how do we put that together. And so working with Bob Batchelder, who was a UCC urban minister, and Lou Finfer, who organized some of these organizations around the state, we brought started to bring clergy together to form Worcester Interfaith as a broad-based community power organization. How did that go? 
<laughs> well, I had a 25-year run at it, so uh-huh. it's gone pretty grand, you know. Uh-huh. The, you, yeah, go ahead. The... Uh, the tool, the tool of, of organizing is relational meetings, meeting with leaders in the community, uh, building bridges, bringing people together, identifying share, con- shared concerns for joint action. And uh, back when we were putting it together, people said, oh, you can't do that in Worcester. You know, neighborhoods will never work together, and clergy aren't going to do that. But w- Worcester's been so great for that. Just like they've been great around the mustard seed, the religious congregations have kept the mustard seed mm-hmm. going this whole time, and um, and they do Worcester Interfaith, and it's a matter of putting our values, you know, the shared values that we have, and how do we work together for deeper kind of change. I mean, as, hearing you say that, as a lifer here, you know, a bunch of generations deep, I think I still hold on to that mentality that uh, y- you can't work across demographics in Worcester. Like, I, and I know from for, I know from doing it myself that it, it actually is very, very doable. But there's always this thing in the way back of your head as a local that yeah, you can't cross those streams. It's yeah. never going to work. Yeah. East and West are never going to talk yeah. to each other. Yeah. You know, it, you're never going to get uh, the Catholic population, the Jewish population, working mm. on the same page. It's, mm. but that's obviously not the case. Right. Right. Were, were there any hurdles institutionally when you got started, or was it just the 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 city rank and file that said, yeah, it's never going to work. Really? <laughs> no, there were the um, what was going on at the time. You may recall that was this out of this. Um, Vatican II, which was this bringing together the church, Catholic Church leadership, uh, Bishop Bernie Flanagan came back to Worcester with a passion for ecumenism. And he was asking people of all faiths to get together in your kitchen, in your living room, and sit down and share what's going on in your faith, what your principles were. So there was this whole base of ecumenism Mm -hmm. that was going on that was strong here. And then it was a matter of how do we roll that into not just action because, you know, there's plenty of charity work that religious congregations, but how do you turn that into kind of political action? What do you, what do you think of as like the the issues in that era that interfaith was influencing? When we got, when we were first getting together, the, so we were formed in 93. As we were putting it together in 92, the uh, city of Worcester uh, closed all the swimming pools. So Worcester used to have nine mm-hmm. swimming pools, one in all these neighborhoods. And uh, budgets got tight, and they closed all the pools. Well, no one wanted to see the pools closed, but there was no joint voice about doing it. And so we organized. The clergy came together, met with the city manager, and he was almost like stunned that we had come together and said, you want the pools open? And we said, yeah, we want the pools open. Well, okay, we'll open the <laughs> pools. You know, it was that kind of a thing. It was almost, yeah. and and we, we, the first year we just opened the inner city pools because, you know, that made that made sense to us and the city could understand that. Um, and then from there we grew it to, to all the pools. But if you, I say this often, if you bring people of faith together and every every uh, church synagogue mosque has a group that's meeting somewhere in the building to talk about the poor to Mm -hmm. talk about who are who's struggling to talk about what they can do Um, and they're also always talking about youth what are we doing about young people so many of our issues early on were about youth so we did a one percent for youth campaign Okay. And what we said was, we want 1% of the budget of the city of Worcester to go to youth programs outside of schools. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the city the city manager produced this budget showing that they were actually putting like 1.5% okay. in. But in order to get that number, they included all the public libraries. <laughs> we're like, come on, that's not a youth program. But you see what I mean? Yeah, Their yeah, reaction yeah. gave us action. Right. That our action is in... The reaction, yeah, you know. Yeah. So we did a lot. We we developed the neighborhood agenda once, and people could vote on it. And it had to do with, you know, what you'd think: potholes, sidewalks, mm-hmm. but also affordable housing, mm-hmm. uh, after-school programs. So those are. It's a lot of. It was a lot around youth and neighborhood and neighborhood crime kind of stuff. Without getting everyone at City Hall mad at us, <laughs> um, where would you say that? Um, mentality is today in terms of is 
Because I mean, you, when you mentioned pools, it, the first thing that popped up. Well, we did that again about ten years ago. Yeah, we, we still did had, it again. you know we replaced right. them with sprinklers. And, right, uh, we right. Haven't really and we fought back. that fight yeah. too. I mean, um, is it, but our contention, just one thing about sure, that, sure. our contention is people say, um, you know, Worcester's neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. We love Worcester neighborhoods. Well, that's crap. Yeah. You know, you only you only love them if you're putting money in. And where do you put your money? You got to put your money into institutions where families can gather. That's what makes a neighborhood. Right. So we've been one by one getting rid of them, getting rid of the pools, getting rid of the branch libraries. Worcester used to have six branch libraries, and there's only one because that neighborhood fought it. Um, and um, our schools are locked at three o'clock. Mm-hmm. I mean. There's no place to to gather. So a lot of our effort for Worcester Interfaith has been around that. And I give city uh, manager Augustus a lot of credit. He's brought the parks programs back, and that was a key thing. It wasn't just pools, pools and parks. Um, And how do we rebuild some of these institutions? I think the schools need to do a much better job of being accessible to the neighborhood. You go to any neighborhood in Worcester, the best building in that neighborhood, the best public building for education, recreation, bringing people together, it's the school. Mm -hmm. That's the best building. And when you lock them, and most people know this, especially inner city, when you lock the school up at 3 o'clock, you got a pretty sad neighborhood. Yeah. Oh, and one thing else about that. When's the highest crime in the city of Worcester? When school's out. School three yeah. to six p.m. Yeah, duh. Our children. <laughs> so the problem <laughs> is the children. We have to get rid of the children. That's no, right. But that's right. I mean, getting, growing up around here, that's something I remember so fondly. You know, when the entire on election day, right? I mean, we still did them in the schools at the time, and yeah. just that sense of pride being an elementary school kid running a bake sale for a bunch of strangers, right. but who right. were from the neighborhood coming in to vote and what right. have you. And to this day, it's the reason why anytime you know my son wants to go play basketball or something, I insist that we go to a school playground because it's yeah. illegal and you're not supposed to be on them when they're going and he always gets nervous like the police are right, going to show up like right, trust right. me we're, we're fine but these are our schools right it is kind of amazing when you realize that we've got you know surveillance cameras on basketball courts to make sure nobody's using them at, at the end of school hours and you're right, right that is kind of for every neighborhood the hub of, of right, the, or at least right. was at one point in right. time and people complain oh the net gets torn down well, duh, yeah, that's, that's what happens to nets right. when you use you them. You can buy a case of them on Amazon for 50 bucks. <laughs> I, we can cover that I'm one. In, I'm in for a case, <laughs> Brendan. This is 508, Worcester's week-by-week good faith survey of evidence. We'll be back with more. <laughs> what do you, I mean, so, what do you, you think? Get the, you get the connection between the mustard seed and community organizing. Is uh, that fit? We should go back into that because I think that was it probably lines up with the question I was just going to ask you was what has changed in the city over the last 30, 40 years where, I, and I'm not dismiss, I'm not being dismissive. Mm-hmm. I know we've got lots of people that are working their tails off in uh, community organizing and, and what have you, but it, it seems just from a sideline perspective that there's, there's not momentum or there's mm-hmm. not uh, mm-hmm. the, the mm-hmm. sort of um, uh, passion, I guess, from mm-hmm. a... You know, someone who's who's always standing around waiting to be drawn into the fray. Mm-hmm. That like, mm-hmm. what what is what what doesn't exist anymore in that social fabric? Right. That uh, there That's doesn't a seem to be question. a pressing need for that kind of organizing. It's, do you think Do you think that our institutions have just uh, evolved to be able to deal with that? Like, obviously now, if you're going to close the pools, the first thing you're going to ask is, what are all these gadflies and neighborhood troublemakers going to do about? Us closing the pools. That's going to definitely be part of your calculus. But, you know, so then I think right. it's less, less valuable to do that organizing. Well, I think, too, public is a dirty word now. Public yeah. wasn't always a dirty word. Public schools, public parks, public. Those were, those were not negative. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I mean, what you're talking about just that, you know, even a lot of the action in. Um, public, I can bring this up. Yeah. Out, out are the lights out all, and over each quivering form, the curtain, a funeral pall, comes down with the rush of a storm, and the angels all pallid and wan, uprising, unveiling, affirm that the play is the tragedy, man, and its hero, the conqueror, worm. Live from the hidden depths of Worm Town, this is 508, a show about Worcester today. We're talking to Frank Carthizer about community organizing, and Brendan 
You had a question. Well, I feel it before I have a question. I feel it's more important to just. I keep noticing uh, Frank has a, a look on his face when you're talking, uh, doing these intros. Like he has no idea what's going on. I just want to make clear to Frank, I have no idea what's going on either. <laughs> this just happens once a week, and I roll with it. So don't I, feel uncomfortable. It's very right. exciting because I feel like the producers at this point have gotten used to it. I just remember the first time we did This Is the Water and This Is the Well, yeah. and Hank Stoltz, who was producing the show, looked up as though some sort of black magic was invading yeah. the studio. <laughs> the cult had just moved into his radio station. Like, I don't know which way to go, a deer in the headlights. You Go ahead, Brent. No, I, I, it's, kind of, it's probably too big of a question to really answer, but it, you know, again, just from a local perspective, do you, what do you think has changed in terms of community organizing uh, over the last few decades? Where, I mean, you're, you're describing what mm-hmm. sounds like a... Mm-hmm. Um, uh, a set of institutions that are willing to work together, as well as a bunch of in, uh, groups of individuals that are willing to be the glue for those institutions and actually keeping things moving. I, I can't help but feel, and just from the sidelines, that nowadays, more often than not, it seems as though the hurdles that ne- we need to get over in the city are almost too big to conquer anymore. Right? No, not too big, no. Um, and um, I, But I think you're asking a good question. We're doing more organizing, I think better organizing. And things are getting harder and things are getting tougher. And part of that I put on our institutions. Mm-hmm. They're struggling. They're struggling across the board, not just a religious, but neighborhood, um, civic, business, all of them. You know, from the Rotary Club to the neighborhood uh, organization. People have less time, less energy for it. Mm-hmm. And when those institutions struggle, that's bad for all of us. That's going to be less for all of us because that's... Those institutions, unions, I would argue they stand between families and what some people call raw economic power. Mm -hmm. What's raw economic power? That's where you don't get to decide, you know, what hours you work or how you work or how what you make. You know, we for our organizing effort when we started working on the minimum wage, this was about six years ago. The minimum wage was eight dollars an hour. And three years from now, because of our work with other people around the state, it'll be $15 an mm-hmm. hour. But that wouldn't have happened if we weren't organizing. Right. And these institutions, they come out of leisure. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You have to have some leisure to be able to be part of a religious congregation, sure. union, any of that. And people don't have that kind of leisure. They're They're under this pressure around money. And, you know, since the 70s, Income, growth and income is flat. Yeah. Flat. And so I think of that economic pressure and our institutions need to come together to give people that space where they can have a civic life. That's yeah. what we're about. I mean, that's that's kind of a simple answer. I no, mean, and I it's the right one, a, too. But from your perspective on the way the transition with Worcester Interfaith, uh, the, that particular institution is strong in the sense that it's going to be able to keep doing the uh, the work that it has been doing on that front? We're going to we're gonna keep doing it. We're going to get better at it. Mm-hmm. we got better organizers. It's, that is not going to make it easier. Yeah. We're just going to have to work harder just to stay where we're at. But now religious congregations are working with unions. Mm-hmm. Unions would work on their own. They did their own thing. You know, they had the money. They had the people. They could do it. They had the muscle. Yeah. Uh, churches had the muscle. When we met with the... You know, back getting the pools open, we didn't put a thousand people in the room. You know, we put a bunch of clergy in and said, "Come on, open them up." Yeah. They don't. There's not that kind of recognition or clout. You got to build it, and you got to build it with allies, and you got to find as many as you can. And, you know, uh, power is organized people and organized money. So you got to put those together. Is it completely unrelated but germane question? I promise, because you just mentioned a, <laughs> a, a a word that I thought interesting. You brought up allies. How do you feel about contemporary organizing and what seems to be a little bit of a creep uh, into that universe where it comes to litmus tests and you know how how you pick who your allies are and who can't actually be a part of your circle? Because that's something that I I find challenging again in terms of uh, figuring out lay of the land is Mm -hmm. if you don't 100% meet somebody's criteria you can't be in and it seems more isolating long term than not and not uh, conducive to organizing. Right, and if you can set those limited those limited boundaries, you probably have too much money. <laughs> most of us, yeah. most of us can't set those kind of limits. But like for for interfaith organizing, we agree that where we disagree, we mm-hmm. leave that at the door. Huh. But 
we agree on a whole lot more right. than we disagree on. Well, we disagree on some stuff. Leave it at the door. Let's do this other stuff. Yeah. Unions, I'd argue that's kind of the same way. That's also true. Right. We're, we're There's now incentive to find common ground rather than disincentive. Yeah. There just always seems to be a, <clears throat> a, a thread that crops up and, again, kind of contemporary organizing where it seems like, Again, you're going to be 100%. And those litmus tests you know, always drive me nuts. No, it is. And you're right. You should get. You should be an organizer, Brennan. You probably are because you, that's what organizers do. They they build. Here's what happens is issues divide people. Right. And so what you have to do first is do the deep relational work, which I call community organizing, mm-hmm. is nothing other than the deep relational work you need to build trust yeah. so that you can move into joint action. And you got to have that trust. Um, Barack uh, Obama was an organizer before he was president. And he said, the problem in our inner city isn't a lack of solutions. We know what the solutions. It's a lack of power Mm -hmm. to implement those solutions. And it's a lack of of power because uh, poor people live in chronic isolation. Isolation, you know, they say... um, Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts, absolutely. And I would argue powerlessness corrupts and absolute powerlessness corrupts, absolutely. And that's what poor and low-income people suffer, that kind of isolation. And how do you break through that? You know, something, I just, my brain is just going every which way. I've just been thinking <laughs> yeah. about all kinds of things. During Those this. worms got you going, um, man. You know, I mean, something that I hadn't, Something that's something that's been bothering me in recent months. I'll just throw this out there. This is part of this. I don't think you can address this. I feel like there's a. I feel like in so many areas of my life, around things that I care about, uh, one of the key problems is a lack of leadership. That there are so many issues and so many parts of Worcester that I care about, and that I don't want to reinvent the wheel. I don't want to yeah. start a whatever. I want to go to somebody and say, hey, I want to be part of your group. If I could spend 45 minutes a week on this, what what do I do? Tell me what to do. I feel like there's so many things that I care about that I don't know who that person would be. Or if there's anybody who's doing that, they're not people that I feel uh, trust in. Not that mm-hmm. I distrust mm-hmm. them, but just mm-hmm. that like – if you don't feel a, an active trust to, towards somebody, right. like you said, relationship building, right? right? It, relationship right. building is not just like, okay, I know I know Bishop <laughs> Bob to recognize him and he seems like a fine guy. It's like, mm-hmm. I know where he's coming from. We've worked on some things together. And I know that if Bishop Bob cares about issue X, Y, Z, and I say, hey, what do I do around this? Bishop Bob is going to say, do this. And that's actually going to connect into a real effort. I mean, I know people are doing a million kinds of community organizers right. in Worcester. There's a million people whose paid position is community mm-hmm. organizer. There's people knocking on doors, calling the phones 24-7 around the city. But I still feel like around so many things that I care about, lack of leadership. And I think people, um, community organizing is that deep relational work. And some people try to cut to the issue. Issues divide. That's what they do. You can't you can't do a shortcut here. you got to go to the relationships. And build those kinds of relationships and trust. I had to organize for at least a decade around things that weren't that important to me in order to build the trust to work on things that were important yeah. to me. You know, pools are nice, but it wasn't what got me up in the morning. You know, but you got to do that to get the campaigns going. The other thing I'd say is, what is a leader? Who is a leader? A leader is a person who intentionally develops relationships in order to find out shared interests yeah and then they're creative enough to identify joint action i mean those at i went through that formula before but it's so important that you have a rhythm to how you think about it and you need followers not in a pejorative way but you need people that you know and you know their interests and you say okay if i'm meeting with you you know and you're saying i'm really concerned about young people and i say wow that's really great, Mike. I'm I'm having a meeting tonight with a bunch of elderly people about health care. Would you come to the meeting? I just look like a jerk. <laughs> right, you know, I right. look like an ass. Right. I mean, I gotta I gotta think hard about you. What's what's got what your what your interests are and what are you ready to do and how do I challenge you to take some action on it? You know what? I, this, this is just going to be me complaining about community organizers for the last couple of minutes of the show. <laughs> it because I, I never thought about this before. I I feel like. 
it's so funny, you know, you talk about it taking decades to really be a community organizer or, or, or to build that relationship, to taking years. I mean, community organizer is definitely a job position that you can get right out of college. And I feel... Just print your own business cards. Well, I mean, I but it's like, you know, it's like a job, it's a position in many organizations yeah. and they'll hire a, a graduating right. senior, sure. And these people are great and they're working really hard. But it's kind of like if on your first day of med school... You are now going down to the hospital and being like, "Hi, now I'm, I'm Dr. Mike," yeah, and people right. being like, "Sure, operate." Right. Right. You would be like, "You're on the path to learning right, how to right. do the job." But right. in medicine, there's this recognition that right. it's going to take right. some years before we should really let you operate on patients yeah. and before people are going to give you right. that title. But community right. organizer is the kind of thing where you print yourself a business card and you're up and away. Uh, like I do, I guess I just think about this because I have this relation, I have this situation with some community organizers who I have to deal with, where we have conversations. And the conversations frequently hit this wall where I'm like, well, I'm not going to tell this person anything about what's really going on mm -hmm. because I don't know this person barely at all. I don't know what this person is going to say mm -hmm. about right. what I said. I don't right. know what kind of confidential information I right. can give this person. I don't know how they're going to misunderstand it. I don't really even know what this person is motivated by. Right. So right. how am I going to have any kind of honest conversation around the the things that we really want to work on. Right. It's, don't you, do it. But don't if I know do it, Mike. Like, you're well, right. I think, about that. I think about that every conversation I have. I'm just like, do I want this on the front page of the newspaper <laughs> tomorrow? And, you know, if it's with certain people, I'm like, I don't know if it, it might it might be on the front page of the paper. I'm not going to have the conversation. But if I have a relationship for years with somebody, right. Kevin right. Kassen, former, you know, yep. still community organizer, right? right. I would tell Kevin Kassen. I would confess any crime to Kevin. <laughs> I've known Kevin for years. I know he's not going to rat me out to the cops. I'm not right. worried about that. I think the leadership point that you both brought up, though, is kind of the key. I mean, I, maybe it was just uh, terrible parenting where I was raised to be suspicious of authority. But mm -hmm. I was always kind of, again, raised with the idea that uh, people who seek leader, ro roles as, as leaders tend to either be cult oh. leaders or sociopaths. Oh, um, and then, like, mm. real leadership is similar to the old adage about pornography. You know, you can't define it, but you'll know it when you see it. Right. And right. I... Yeah. I right. guess that is kind of part of the problem. Maybe that's a roundabout way to, to getting back to what I was saying before about maybe what, what's changed in, in mm -hmm. Worcester over the mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. It does seem more and more like people want to be leaders on the, you know, on the issue that means the most to them mm -hmm. without being able to tie it back to, say, just an outsider like myself and, and get that your issue is never going to be my issue. But I'll be right. happy to support right. you in your issue just as right. long as you're somehow willing to acknowledge that I exist as a human being. Right. Well, it's a good point. For Worcester Interfaith, we're a multi-issue organization. Mm -hmm. Why? Because life is multi-issue. Yeah. And so we're looking for leaders in a in a range of where, where their interests are and where we can take that kind of action. Um, but uh, you know, leadership and all that, as you were saying, it's it's overused and little understood. Yeah. But um, for Worcester Interfaith, just our simple mission statement is: Worcester Interfaith develops leaders to build justice so we can work for social justice and change. But it starts with leadership development and that kind of relational work. Final word. We have a couple We have a couple minutes left, so I just want to uh, threaten the audience with what, with, with what might happen on future shows, and then we can wrap it up. So, you know, dear listener, if you have a, a sophisticated opinion about parking policy, it's probably because you've read an article that summarized a book by Donald Shoup, parking scholar. That's certainly how I came up with all of my sophisticated ideas about parking <laughs> is reading blog posts, summarizing Donald Shoup things. Uh, Donald Shoup has just come out with a book which he has edited. This camera has been crazy. Oh my goodness. Uh, called Parking in the City. This is a, a series of new essays both by him and by other parking scholars. I haven't read this book yet. I got this from a community organization called the Worcester Public Library. <laughs> but I'm going to have so many strong opinions, Brendan, after I read each chapter of this book, which I will then tell you in the coming weeks as though it was the Ten Commandments. Which I will derail and turn into a conversation about uh, the updated uh, Monopoly pieces. But, uh, <laughs> you feel like you feel like the Monopoly theme on this book cover is... Yeah, I think it's old, fantastic, but we're car. changing. We've been changing over the pieces over time, and uh, that's probably carries some weight and something worth discussing as well too. Brent Carthizer, thank you for being on the thank show. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, fantastic. Glad, glad I come thanks for your thanks here. for your thanks for your service. Thanks for being one of the one of the people in Worcester who I do feel like I can turn to for leadership and actually. Are you use moving my back to Chicago now, or are you staying put? No. Oh, no, good. Okay. Worcester, no, <laughs> Worcester. Worcester. Finally had enough. And Worcester. 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 Worcester.